the American Society of Pension Actuaries, celebrating 25 years of dedicated service to the private pension system, presents this recording from the 1991 Pension Actuaries and Consultants Conference, held September 29th through October 2nd. We take you now live to the Grand Hyatt Hotel in Washington, D.C., where the program is just now beginning. Session 6C, over 90, will be found at tab 38 in your book. The normal reminders, there is no smoking in this or any of the other sessions at ASPA. In the back of your program, are the continuing education cards. For those of you so inclined, we would appreciate that you tear that out and complete that for your credits, as well as the yellow valuation sheet at the end of Larry's presentation, and drop those off at the uh, box, which is there 10 minutes prior to the end of this session. Larry would prefer you fill it out now. And do you want fives or sixes? Fives. Fives. We have a microphone in the middle of the floor, and we ask that you approach the microphone to ask your questions so that it can be recorded uh, on the tapes. We're not that overly crowded that most people can't get to the mic, but if you can't, I will endeavor to repeat the question into the microphone. Uh, Larry has consented to take questions uh, during the presentation. So as you have a question, please come to the microphone. It's my pleasure to introduce Larry Starr. Uh, Larry originally had his background with Connecticut General, both in the home office and then as a sales manager in the field. Uh, he's currently president of Qualified Plan Consultants which is in Springfield, Massachusetts. He's a member of the Board of Directors of ASPA, as well as a member of the Education and Examination Committee. He's a frequent speaker on employee benefit topics around the country. And his educational background, he has an MBA from the, in insurance from the University of Hartford. Larry also has an alphabet of initials. He is not only a CPC, he is an FLMI, a CLU, a CEBS, a CHFC, an enrolled agent, and he was telling me that some other organization has just conferred upon him a CTP. Or something. I don't see any Zs in there, so I guess you got one or two more letters to go. It's my pleasure to introduce Larry Starr. Thank you, Bob. Okay. The uh, issue on, if you have questions while we're going through, if the question will take no more than 10 seconds to ask from your chair, it's okay to ask it from your chair, and we, and we will repeat it, either Bob or I will repeat it. Uh, anything longer than that, see if you can get over to the microphone, because uh, I can't remember anything that's more than 10 or 15 seconds. Um, so we'd appreciate that. Our conversation this morning is going to be about a piece of legislation that, for some reason to me, seems like it's two or three years old, um, yet it was only passed last year. It's over 1990, the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of that year. Um, uh, OBRA did a number of things. You know, we're obviously concerned about how it affected uh, what we do. But we shouldn't forget that there were some other major provisions in that, in that Reconciliation Act, some that we've seen a lot of recently, where the services again got their fingers involved in, uh, in, in the business of running our local governments um, uh, with regard to the Social Security issue and whether or not uh, the benefits that a local state or uh, local 
municipality provides to its employees meets IRS's standards of what a retirement plan should be so that that municipality is exempt from the Social Security taxation. Uh, this, if you've looked at that, you have seen that the service has basically decided that only they can determine what a plan is. And if you don't like their rules, you're covered by Social Security. I expect we'll see lots of lawsuits in that area. Um, so over 90, my guess is going to become widely known uh, in many of our uh, local and state um, government operations as a piece of legislation that they were not all that pleased with, uh, with the IRS's interpretation of. But in any case, we're going to be talking primarily about the asset reversion issue, uh, which is so near and dear to our hearts. Um, if you remember, back before this 90 law was passed, before over 90, we had an excise tax on reversions from qualified plans. Uh, that excise tax was 15 percent, and that is an excise tax. That's a tax in addition to some other tax. And the other tax that that, in fact, is in addition to is ordinary income, so that if there is a reversion, it's includable in the ordinary income of the employer who is receiving the reversion, plus on top of that, there is an excise tax. So we're talking about this additional tax on top that used to be 15 percent, um, but even that was only a few years old because some of us still remember when there was no reversion tax. Congress's intent when they established the, uh, the tax on reversions was that it should recapture the economic benefit, uh, or the tax benefits rather, that the employer received by having taken a deduction, put money into a plan, having it grow tax-free within the plan, and then eventually pull it out so it's a much larger sum, and paying the same tax rate at a later date that they would have paid at an earlier date, um, they get the tremendous advantage of the compounding, which we all know about, and which is why we set up retirement plan trusts, uh, one of the reasons why we set them up in the first place. Um, Congress felt that there was some unfairness, that maybe the federal government should get a share of that growth, since it really wasn't necessary, and there was a give up that, go that the Congress had given away by allowing people to put away too much money and gave up the revenue on that over their stream, their time, uh, uh, where they would have normally had that as income to pay for the uh, running of our government, or more, more correctly, to pay the debt on our national uh, debt. Um, so Congress wanted to look at that 15 percent, and in looking at it, they felt that it just didn't recover enough of those earnings, so that there was a, a feeling that it needed to be a bigger number. And of course, anytime we say Congress, we really don't mean Congress. We all know we mean the staff who works there and who continues there regardless of who actually is elected. And those individuals had an agenda, and the agenda had to do with the retirement plan, excise taxes, and uh, there was a feeling that it needed to be higher to recapture this tax benefit. Um, there's also a belief that Congress in some way is a little bit concerned about what's going on in the retirement uh, field. We've seen the bills that have been added uh, over the last year or so that have not been passed, but that have been proposed dealing with simplification. Um, Congress perhaps wanted to encourage employers to do something to continue plans, to not do, uh, to not terminate their retirement plans without any replacement of some other type of qualified program. So that there is some encouragement in the bill uh, if you're terminating a defined benefit plan um, to either increase benefits to your employees to make up for the fact that they're not going to have it in the future, um, or perhaps to provide some sort of a replacement plan. And basically, we're being provided an economic incentive to do that. And we're going to talk about all these, these things in detail. And what the 90 Act did is it increased the excise tax rate. And it creates a two-tier tax rate structure. The new rate is 20 percent. The new rate is 20 percent. Um, and it's Code Section 4980A, and in your outline, at the back of the outline, um, is both the actual printed copy of the code as well as the um, actual legislation uh, as passed. And that's at the back of the outline. It's there for reference. Uh, in my notes, I've also referenced all the sections. Um, I will probably at this point stop telling you where the references are. You can read it or find it. Um, and we'll just talk about what it says. But this new rate of 20 percent applies if and only if one of three specified circumstances apply. If you don't meet one of these three rules, then otherwise the tax is 50 percent in all other cases of all, all other plan terminations. So what we're looking at is how do we get the 20 percent rule to apply instead of the 50 percent rule? Well, there are, in fact, uh, three ways we can do that 
to get the 20% rate, which is the lower of the two, rather than paying the 50% rate, both of which are still higher than what the law used to be. Well, one easy way is to have your client declare Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Um, and I haven't had very many clients who wanted to deal with the reversion issue by declaring Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Um, it has to be Chapter 7, not Chapter 11. Chapter 7 is where you close up, uh, give away all your money, and, and go out of business. Um, you don't try to pay anybody off. You don't try to work it out. Whatever's there is there, and you're gone. Uh, chapter 11 is the one that we're more used to, where people try to reorganize, pay off some portion of their debt, and continue in business. Um, so the Chapter 7 bankruptcy liquidation is not a particularly attractive uh, position. I point out that when the client goes out of business, generally they don't pay more more money to you over the future years. So as a, as a business, that isn't attractive to us either. Um, interestingly enough, in the law, they said Chapter 7 bankruptcy or a similar state court proceeding. Now, I know nothing about state court proceedings. I haven't asked any of our lawyer friends what that means. Um, but it does remind me of a similar uh, piece of legislation they passed a number of years ago, if you remember, dealing with uh, collectibles. Uh, Congress decided that uh, uh, since gold coins were collectibles, but it would be nice if Congress could sell gold coins to IRAs, um, that it would be okay if we bought U.S. gold coins or gold coins of the states. Um, of course, Congress passed that law, uh, and my reading of the Constitution and most others limits the right to coin uh, money to the federal government. So I'm not really sure what gold coins or, or coins of the states are, and I'm not sure what similar state bankruptcy liquidation proceedings are. Um, both of them may not exist. Uh, but it's not going to be particularly attractive in any case to your client to, as a way to save their 50% reversion tax. Uh, assuming that if they save the 50%, all the money that they get is going to go to the liquidating, uh, to the cost of the liquidation and to paying off their creditors, so they don't end up with anything anyway. That's one way not particularly attractive. The other two ways are methods that we're going to talk about and methods that we probably will be using. Um, one is to provide certain pro rata benefit increases uh, under the terminating plan, uh, and the alternative to that, the third method that we're allowed, is to establish uh, or maintain, and that's important, a qualified replacement plan. Uh, that gives us another acronym that we'll be start talking about. Those are QRPs, QRPs, Qualified Replacement Plan. Um, I know when we dealt with the last Q, which was, which was QDRO, um, some people say Quadro and some people say QDRO. Uh, QRP, I'm not sure that there's any great discrepancy, so I think QRP will work, um, and if you have a different way of pronouncing it, let me know afterwards and I'll uh, add it to the outline. Um, okay, qualified replacement plans is the, is the other option that we have. Um, an amount that is transferred to a qualified replacement plan is not included in the employer's income, and it is not subject to the excise tax on reversions. So we've avoided both of the taxes that we're concerned about on the reversion side. Um, Congress felt it was necessary to include what I think is obvious, but um, we'll say it anyway. There also is no deduction for transferring that money from the terminating plan to the qualified replacement plan. Um, there's no tax deduction. There's no taxes on it. Uh, okay, let's talk about the pro rata benefit increase. This is an increase in the present value of each participant's accrued benefit under the terminating plan. It takes effect immediately upon the termination date, and note that well. Okay. The amount of the benefit increases must have a total present value of at least, remember at least, it's underlined, it's in bold, because that's very important, as you'll see in a minute. It has to be at least 20% of the maximum amount which could have reverted to the plan sponsor. So we have to gross up benefits by spending at least 20% of the maximum reversion. And there's some problem words in there which we're going to get to uh, that isn't all that clear with the, what that means. And I don't think that's a surprise to anybody that it isn't all that clear. They have, we have to provide the benefit increases to all qualified participants, a defined term. And th those benefit increases must be in the proportion that the present value of each participants accrued benefit bears to the total present value of all qualified participants, but it's subject to one condition. And that condition is that we cannot provide more than 40% of the 20% amount, which could have reverted to the sponsor. Uh, none of, no more than 40% of that can be applied to increased benefits 
to qualified participants who are not active participants. Uh, so terminees, uh, pre previously retired employees. Um, now, there, there is some concern here as to really what that meant. Um, the maximum allocation to non-active participants is 8%. In my mathematics, if you take 40% of 20%, it's 8%. There's been a number of people who've said, well, let's allocate all of the excess, which we per certainly can do. It's a minimum of 20%. We can allocate 100% and avoid the excise tax on any reversion. That's true. Um, the law says we have to provide no more than, we can provide no more than 40% um, of what would have been allocated uh, to gross up the benefits to non-active um, participants. That seems to say we could provide 40% of the 100% or 40% of the dollar amount. If you look at it closely, you will see that it locks you in to the 20% number. It doesn't matter how much you actually give, it's 40% of 20%. Now, if I was writing the rules, I would have said 8%. Um, but I don't know why they didn't think that that was an appropriate way of dealing with it. Um, I think it would have been a more uh, reasonable way of saying it. It would have been clear what they meant. Uh, but it is, in fact, uh, 8%. So in my example, if you allocated 30%, of the excess assets to the um, participants. You can't allocate 40% of the 30%, the 12%, you're still limited to 8%. And there is a sample uh, termination amendment in there that we've um, provided that includes the hardwired 8% language. It's a question, if it's less than 15 seconds. Uh, in the, on your example, you were proposing having no reversion for the Okay, the comment is if you're allocating all of the amount um, to the uh, employees and you're not going to have any reversion coming back to the employer, um, if you're doing that, then since there's no reversion, even if it brings you back to the 50%, that is you don't qualify because you've exceeded 40% of the amount, so what? Because 50% is zero. The concern I would have is whether or not you would be allowed to, in fact, do that. I think you'd have to find another provision other than this language that would allow you to do that. And assuming you're meeting A4 and everything else, I think you're right. Um, but in order to come within this provision, um, I, you, I don't think there's any question that if you exceed the 40% or the 8%, you're not within the scope and you don't have the exemption. The question is, where is it going to come from? It seems that your, your comment is reasonable, and hopefully that's the way it would work. But certainly it's going to have to be done on a non-discriminatory basis in that case. Um, the real issue will come up when you're not allocating 100%, when there is any amount of reversion and you want to avoid the 50%. Larry, excuse me, just to make a, a comment there, since you are allocating by present value and if you had a permitted disparity in the plan, you probably would lose the permitted disparity, the chances are that this 8% is going to govern if you're going to use reversions, uh, use the gross up of more than 40%. I'm going to come back and cover that specific issue on the integration because I, I don't even think it's as clear as that. I think we've still got some, some muddy issues, some very muddy issues there uh, that certainly have not been resolved. Um, at this point. Uh, so anyway, we do know, need to know what a qualified participant is because we have to provide this increase to the qualified participants. Uh, who are they? They're an active participant, nice and easy. Uh, a participant or beneficiary in pay status is a, is a qualified participant. Uh, not an active participant, but this is the general overall qualified participant category. A participant who as of the termination date has a vested right uh, to benefits and whose credited service terminated during the period beginning three years before the plan terminated and ending with the distribution of assets. In other words, a, sp a specific category of individual who uh, uh, has terminated within that three years before the termination of the plan. And then a beneficiary of a participant whose service terminated during that same period um, uh, if they have a vested right as of the termination date of the plan, would also be considered active, I'm sorry, would also be considered qualified participants. So that's the identified group that we have to increase the benefits for uh, in order to avoid having to pay the 50% excise tax, which is what we're attempting to accomplish. So if we have a terminated defined benefit plan that has $2 million uh, in assets and $1 million of liabilities, 
and we have 10 active participants. Um, and each active participant has an accrued benefit of 50,000. And we all have plans like this, right? Um, and let's assume there's five other qualified participants who each have exactly a present value of 100,000. Makes for a nice short example. It makes for no sense in the real world, but at least you can see how it works. In order to avoid the 50% tax, um, the minimum benefit increase has to equal the present value of the 200,000, um, 20 percent of a possible 1 million version, uh, reversion. Um, so of that 200,000, we can give 40 percent of it, um, $80,000, to benefit increases for the non-active participants. Uh, each of their benefits increases by 16,000. We take the 80, we divide it by uh, the five non-active because they're all equal. Of course, that's not in the real world, but that makes it easy here. Um, so they're all going to go up 16,000 um, to 116,000. The balance, the additional 120 uh, that's still available, uh, will be allocated pro rata to the remaining 10 active participants in proportion to their present value of accrued benefits, which is a pro rata in this case. And that brings them uh, up uh, 12,000 to 62,000 apiece. And that's basically how, the, how it would work, uh, assuming that you wanted to do that. The present value that we use in the calculations is determined on the termination date. And we have to use the same actuarial assumptions as plan liabilities uh, are determined uh, on termination. Now the 10-year phase-in rule for benefit increases, the 415B5D, uh, luckily has been eliminated for purposes of this provision. Um, I think that would be another issue, going back to your 100% allocation, um, that it, if we didn't uh, meet the 20%, uh, the 8% calculation, uh, it, it would appear, I guess, that the 10-year rule would still apply. So that would be another wrinkle in trying to avoid um, a problem. So the 10-year phase-in rule is eliminated if we meet these rules. It does not apply to benefit increases resulting from our pro rata benefit increase. Uh, if the increases do not discriminate in favor of highly compensated employees under 414Q. That's what it says. And we're going to come back to that because that's a significant issue. Okay. Benefits cannot be in question. Who takes the loss of uh, decreasing PBGC rates from the time of termination to the time of distribution? Also, the decrease in trust earnings from in such six months period. Because why, why well, six month period? Well, well like uh, we, we have a real case, the distribution is date after tomorrow. The plan termination date was April 1st. You calculate everything at seven and a quarter PBGC rates. In the meantime, my excess went down drastically mm -hmm. for two reasons. Uh, the trust did not return the 8% we anticipated, right. which as an actuary you had to assume for the PBGC certification. In the meantime, the, the PBGC Rates for October are six and three quarter percent, so the present value of all basic benefits went up, and we in effect have a fifteen thousand dollar lower trust corpus to right to deal with. Yeah, I um I don't have an, a, an easy answer for your situation, but I think I have an easy answer, and I'm going to hold off on it because it's in the amendment, because I think there's a way you have to deal with that. Uh, the question is, at what point do you determine the reversion? Um, and, and we're going to get to that. It is in the amendment. I want to walk you through it. Um, Okay, we cannot increase benefits, um, nor can we amount, allocate any amount to the account of a participant in a defined contribution plan, replacement plan, which we haven't talked about yet. But no benefits may be increased if such increase would violate the 401A4 rules or the qualification code section 415. Extremely important, and again, we're going to come back to why those are important and what does pro rata mean if you also have to comply with 401A4, which gets us into the issue, uh, and all of the qualification requirements, which gets us into the issue of what if you have an integrated plan and how you do that, and we will get into that. Um, if any participant's benefit increase is reduced by the rules regarding non-discrimination under A4, whatever those rules might be, uh, even now that we have them, it, we're not sure what they mean, um, or by 415 limits, the amount of the reduction is reallocated to the remaining participants on the same pro rata basis. So if you get cut off by an A4 test of some sort, or a 415 test of some sort, um, the dollars that are cut off simply get reallocated to the remaining people until they're used up, uh, as long as you, that doesn't produce another A4 or 415 limit. It's going to be an iterative process um, to get to the allocation of the total dollars that you're talking about. 
qualified replacement plan is the other method that's, that's possibly going to work, that's going to allow us to avoid the 50% excise tax and, and luckily only pay 20%. Um, we need to provide a corp. This is a qualified plan that's either established or maintained by the employer. So it can be an existing plan. We don't have to set up a new one, but in many cases we might, um, which meets the following requirements. The qualified replacement plan must include as active participants at least 95% of all the active participants in the terminated plan who are still employed by the employer. Luckily, they gave us that last out, who are still employed by the employer. We probably all have situations just because of the economy um, where plans have terminated for whatever reasons, but the amount of employees have gone down drastically. Um, that 95% rule for the first five minutes when we were reading it, when it came out, was, was a heart stopper. Uh, as it turns out, it is in fact not a significant issue as long as your eligibility requirements are basically the same um, as the old plan, you'll meet this requirement. It's not really an issue. Um, because it's only those who are employed at that point. Uh, again, I think that was a, a conscious gift by somebody to recognize that, uh, that it makes sense if we're going to provide ongoing benefits for continuing employees, um, we shouldn't be hampered by 95% uh, of who we had at time of termination of the plan or who we had over the last number of years or any other such calculation. We then have to take a direct transfer of those assets from the terminating plan to the qualified replacement plan before any reversion of assets to the employer. Before there's a reversion, the money goes to the, to the corp. And the amount transferred, and this is called the cushion amount, that's what it's called in the law, the cushion amount must be 25%. It must be exactly 25%. It must be no more than 25%. It must be no less than 25%. Must be 25%. Right. We didn't think that's what it meant the first day we read it. Um, and in your material, you will find after the amendment uh, a thread. Um, a thread is not a piece of string, but rather a series of messages from the bulletin board um, that ASPA is involved in, the PICS bulletin board, um, which discusses the whole issue from very early when the, when the law came out. And one of the major issues we talked about is, do they really mean 25% when they said 25%? Um, and I think if you read that, I'm not going to read it to you um, or go over it, but I think you'll find that it's extremely interesting how these things develop. Um, and then finally, the IRS, actually Tom Terry, the Treasury Department, um, at a, a, a bar, in, it's a bar meeting in New York, uh, in, in Washington, rather. Um, we were very careful to capitalize it um, in, the, in the thread. Uh, but at a bar meeting in, in Washington uh, around the beginning of this year, um, the exact date is in the thread, announced that, in fact, that's exactly what they meant, 25%, no more, no less, uh, exactly 25%. And there's some reasons for that, which, which we'll go over the mathematics of in a minute. Um, so it's got to be exactly 25% of the amount which could have reverted to the employee. Now remember, on the other test, it's a minimum of 20 for the increase in the present value of the accrued benefits. Here, it is exactly 25%. But the exactly 25% um, can be reduced by the present value of any increases in uh, vested benefits under an amendment which is adopted within 60 days prior to the termination and is effective on the termination date um, for the terminating plan. Notice that amendment has to be adopted within 60 days of the termination date. Uh, and that gives us also some, some cause for concern, which I hopefully the amendment that we have will deal with. So we can get the 20% rate by a combination of the two types of, of situations. We can increase benefits, and we can have a qualified replacement plan. Um, that may be helpful, because if we've increased benefits, and it turns out that when we actually get the time to do the reversion, that we've had changes in assumptions, or we've had changes in PBGC rates, um, or we've had earnings uh, differentials over that period of time, that now mean our reversion is still bigger than it ought to be, um, that we haven't spent the amount of money we needed to spend, we haven't increased the 20%, it turns out to be less than that. Um, we are allowed to take credit for what we did before when we set the termination of the other plan towards the amount, total amount we need and we can solve the problem of what happens if, we, if it turns out that on the day we're distributing it's the wrong amount. We set up a plan, whatever balance is needed goes into the defined contribution, qualified replacement plan, 
if that's what we're going to do. Um, and we've solved our problem. Question. I'd like to point out there's a distinct legal difference between increasing the benefits for the same participants and transferring the assets to a qualified replacement plan which constitutes at least 95 percent of the same participants. I would assume that my trial attorney would immediately go to suit for the benefit of the remaining participants even if it were only one who did not participate in the qualified replacement plan. I don't believe that Congress envisioned that, but I believe it's an opening so that... Uh, but why would he go to trial? I mean, what's the issue? The issue is that... Who the money it, belongs to? It, it's, it's towards an eye certain. In other words, all they're doing here is protecting the corporation against an excise tax. It has nothing to do with planned participants. So therefore, a planned participant who loses uh, assets uh, that are transferred to other plan participants may feel very well, uh, rightfully so, that um, just because he's in a classification that is not covered, that he belongs in that classification for the increase. We'll see. Okay. I, I understand the point. I don't agree with it, but I understand it. Um, I don't think it's an issue other than the overriding issue that has been out there about who does the money belong to. If we can agree that the plan appropriately had reversion language in it, um, and that the employees got exactly what they were entitled to. This participant who was in the defined benefit plan received every penny he was entitled to, um, including any adjusted benefits by amendment. What the employer does with those assets that could have reverted is within the scope of this law. Um, and if he decides to put it in a qualified replacement plan, um, then I don't see any significant issue that's any different than if he simply reverted the money. That's the, the, the concern that I would have. It's the same issue. And if you have an attorney who wants to argue that the old defined benefit plan was written in such a way as to preclude reversions, sure, that issue still exists. Uh, that's a very separate issue from, I think, what we're dealing with here. We deal with our typical defined benefit plan. We've had the language in there for 50 years. We didn't screw it up like some of those attorneys did where they had to give all the money to the participants and they couldn't amend the plan, but they specifically said that all the money will be given to the participants without any reversion language. Um, I don't think that's the issue here. So I don't think we have that problem in this kind of a case. Okay, we have a qualified replacement plan that is a DC plan. Somebody asked at, at one session, gee, couldn't we have a defined benefit qualified replacement plan? And I thought for about two seconds, said, well, sure, I guess we could. There's no prohibition on it. But then I go back to, well, we just terminated a defined benefit plan. Why would we be setting up a new one? Is it possible? Yes, it is. I suppose you could do it if you can justify it uh, in, in your mind, in your client's mind, uh, that it made some sense. Um, I think that 99% of the situations are going to be terminating defined benefit plans and defined contribution qualified replacement plans. Um, I can't Im imagine an easy scenario where you might want to set up a replacement defined benefit plan, but I'm sure they're there. So that if you have it, um, I'm sure we can find it rich. Do the asset reversion guidelines from Reagan administration hold anyway? I don't think so. This is law. I mean, I'm not sure that that there's that that, that was uh, that was regulatory. This is this is statutory. Okay, I will. Right, cool. the, the the comment is being made is the that a defined benefit plan that replaces a defined benefit plan wasn't a termination. Maybe. Um, I mean, I think that's something that the service could argue. Um, I, again, I think 99%, maybe it's 100% based on, on your comment. I, I think in all cases that we're dealing with on a, on a normal basis, uh, it's going to be a defined contribution replacement plan. Uh, certainly, the, the, the way the law is written, if you read it, did not limit it to defined contribution replacement plans. And if someone wants to argue that this law allows a defined benefit replacement plan, then it's a facts and circumstances test, I suppose, as to whether you terminated your other plan. And that's an, a service issue. Um, you know, it's a spin-off and merger and all the other things that go, come on with, with that issue. Larry? Yes. How does the... Uh, Talk in the microphone. You're right there. How does the asset transfer to this replacement plan affect 415 uh, for the individual participants? Is there a, there's a yes. 415 effect? Yes, there is. And, and if you hold on, I want to cover it. Okay. But I don't want to answer it right now. We will cover it in just a couple of moments. Because um, we're going to talk about how this money gets allocated, and that's where that answer comes. The... Uh, anything else? Okay. Um, a qualified replacement plan, if, you, if it's a defined contribution plan, 
must either allocate the cushion amount, this transfer assets, in the plan year of the transfer or place it in the suspense account and allocate it uh, to participant accounts no slower than rateably over seven years starting with the year of transfer. Okay, so we can take this money and stick it in a, in a, in a uh, suspense account. And this is another suspense account or a different suspense account from any other suspense account that might be, be set up from any other purpose, including 415 caps or any other reason. This is a separate and distinct suspense account that must maintain that, that um, distinctness until the assets are used up. And you have the right when you set up the re qualified replacement plan to decide over what period of time are you going to spend this money, are you going to give it up to participants in that plan. You can limit it to one year and give it all away in one year. You can go as far as seven years, uh, no longer under the law. Um, the income on that suspense account must be allocated uh, to participant accounts um, no slower than ratably over the remainder of the seven year period. So in other words, it's the principal and the interest get allocated each year. And the methodology that I would think would make most sense is that if you decide to go with the seven year period, you would allocate one-seventh of the pot the first year and one-sixth the next and one-fifth, and that will automatically deal with the interest issue. In the, in the last year, you'll, you'll allocate one-one-th and there's no money left, um, and you would meet all the requirements, uh, I believe. If you cannot allocate it to a participant, if, if there's money left over in that seven-year period, um, in general, that's going to be due to a 415 problem if you have it. Uh, certainly, if you have a one participant plan and, and the guy is fully maxed on a defined benefit and there's no room in the 415E fraction for a defined contribution, um, at the end of seven years, if there's still no room, you're still going to have the money sitting there. Um, so if you get to the end of that seven-year period and the unallocated amount um, uh, cannot be still allocated, it's allocated to all other participants if there are any, if possible. The seven-year period, in my example, can be extended. Um, only if code section, so code section 415 limits prevent an amount from being allocated to any participant at the end of that period. So the service has the right to uh, extend that seven year period. Now, we're not going to know whether that's going to happen for another six years um, and exactly how the service will deal with the issue of an individual who dumped all his money into the DC plan knowing he could never get any of it um, and seven years later asks for an extension. Um, there's going to be a, a, an issue to be resolved in that future period. Quick, quick question. Is yeah. Is the income on the suspense account an annual addition? No. The income is not a suspense account, is, I mean, is not an annual addition. And again, I'll get into the, the issue of the annual additions and how that counts also in a second. In the back. Assuming there's no 415 problem, is there any reason why we can't allocate it on an age-weighted basis? That's a very good question. Um, it says rateably over the period of time. It doesn't say on what basis. You can have an integrated plan, for example. I would assume that there's absolutely no reason, or everything else being met, 415E and so on, that, that there's no reason why it could not be on an age-weighted basis, except if Jim tells us tomorrow age-weighted plans are dead. Um, between the time the regs were issued and yesterday and tomorrow. Um, I would think that would be fine. I, I can't see any reason why not at this point. Okay, let's take a defined benefit plan that terminated with an excess of $100,000 after satisfying all its liabilities. We transfer $25,000 to a defined contribution QRP. Now note, I'm being very careless with my numbers. First of all, I'm making them even. Um, but second, I'm making them as if they're static numbers, and they're not. As, as we heard from somebody who has the problem, where the numbers change. And in fact, we're going to talk about the problems at the end. Um, I'm giving you a nice, simple textbook answers, because textbook authors don't deal in the real world. Um, we are going to have to deal in the real world. But let's deal with the textbook side of it first so we understand it, and then we'll talk about what some of the problems might be. So we've got 25000 of our $100,000 uh, excess. We're transferring it to a DC corp. Uh, no benefit increases were provided under the defined benefit plan. Um, the 25000 that's transferred to the, to the DC plan is not taxable income to the employee, it's not subject to the reversion tax, and it is not deductible by the employer. The employer has the $75,000, though, that's left over um, from the original 100 that was available, um, and that's going to be included in income and is liable for a reduced reversion tax of 20% of the 75000 that reverts, 
and that turns out to be $15,000. Now let's look at the interesting point there. The tax that's paid to the government, if we, if we exercise the, the QRP provisions, um, turns out to be the same 15% that would have been paid before over 90 was, was passed. That is, this is a revenue neutral bill because the, the government will collect the same 15% they had before um, if the provisions are met. Now, of course, there'll be lots of situations where the provisions aren't met and they'll collect more money. So it's at minimum revenue neutral if every single plan in the country adopts this provision because they will collect the same excise tax they would have. It's 20% on a smaller base. It still turns out to be the same 15%. Now, in effect, um, many employers can get a full reversion of the entire excess at only a 15% rate. Um, and this is now the marketing side of it. This is not the tax side of it. This is how you explain it to the client. For those of you who need to explain it to the client and why they should set up a qualified replacement plan, I would not include at the top of the list the fact that they get to pay you fees for more years. That's probably not most important to your client. But if you can show him how he can really get all of his money back instead of having to give it to employees and still get a uh, only 15% excise tax, that might be uh, something that he's interested in. It only works if the employer would have had a defined contribution plan anyway, um, which in many cases is what is happening. And if the employer is going to have a defined contribution plan anyway, and is going to fund it at some level over the next seven years, let's say, um, why couldn't he simply, instead of writing checks out of his pocket for that seven year period, write checks out of the suspense account for the same amount? What happens to what would have been the reversion? It's in his pocket because he didn't spend it, and all he had to pay was the 15% of the total initial reversion that it would have been, and he saved the money over time. It's a marketing issue. It's not a real situation, but it can be sold that way. It can be explained that way. Um, for those of you who remember, when Top Heavy came out, we had required minimums. Um, I don't have a single client who ever provided the required minimum Top Heavies, and I don't mind saying that on the, on the, uh, on the mic. Um, the employees provided it because Tefer gave us some, some significant uh, rules that we had to comply with, the 3% top-heavy minimum. Mr. Employer, what have you been raising the salaries by every year? Well, 6 7% at that point. Okay, next year, let's only raise it by 3% and have the employees, rest of it, go to their top-heavy minimum. You only have to do it once. Only once because from now on, it's in the base. And as you raise salaries each year, automatically, it'll go to both parts. So the employees got to pay the top heavy minimum, not the employer. The government said you had to provide it, didn't say you had to pay it. And the same thing is true in the reversion tax. Okay, you have to, government has to collect, but you don't have to pay for it, assuming you have an ongoing type plan and assuming that you're willing to have a certain budget spent regardless of where the money is coming from. If you're looking to maximize your deductions and your contributions, it's a different story, obviously. Question. Are you saying that uh, in a DC pension, the uh, transferred money can be used to satisfy the 412 uh, minimum contribution? Uh, yes. Yeah. Question? Is the excise tax deductible on the income tax? Is the excise tax deductible on the income tax? Yes. Oh, you mean on the income tax return? No, excise tax is not deductible. It's not a deductible expense. Okay, so that's, that's sort of a way that you can explain it to your client. Um, and, and if it just gives you the, the idea that, um, well, maybe we should do it on the wisest tax basis. Let's use it to fund benefits we would have funded anyway and reduce our liability. I only wanted to give them 5% of pay anyway, and I'll use this pot of money to fund that 5% per year. Now, if we terminate the qualified replacement plan before the suspense account has been allocated to all the participants, then the suspense account is allocated to participants as of the termination date up, up to the 415 limits. And if we still can't allocate it when the plan terminates, the portion that's remaining is treated as a reversion and it's included in the employer's gross income. It's subject to the excise tax on the reversion of 50%. This is the end of side one. Please turn the cassette over for side two.
putting out seven years and then terminating the plan and having a reversion in the DC plan that can come back to the employer because it's not permissibly allocable um, and avoiding the tax. Um, you'll just pay it at that date. Question. Don't you violate the 95% original percentage if there are a turnover and you have new people coming in the plan? Very good question. Uh, and I don't have to repeat it because I thank you for putting it on the mic. Um, no, you don't, because the requirement is that they must be covered at the time you establish that plan. You will have turnover for sure. Um, if you're a McDonald's, you'll probably have 10% covered the next year, and by the third year, it's, it's 1%, the one guy who's running the, the McDonald's franchise. Um, that's perfectly okay. There doesn't appear to be any uh, prohibition against that, and that, that's certainly um, something that I expect would, in fact, happen and is not going to cause you a problem. Is, is there a FIFO requirement on how the money gets allocated? Yeah, and I, I keep hesitating to put it off, but I want to talk about the allocation process in just a minute. So yeah, I will, we will explain that, okay? Um, okay, for the, for the purpose of determining whether there is a quirk, the IRS can provide that two or more plans may be treated as one plan or a plan of a successor employer may be taken into account. Very nice if they will allow us to use a successor employer. We have a termination of a uh, defined benefit plan sole practice and the individual incorporates. Maybe that's why we terminated the plan because the individual incorporated has a partner, 30 years junior, um, they're equal partners and we know what the problem is. Um, they're not going to buy the, the situation. Um, in a case like that, we might be able to take into account the plan of the successor employer, corporate entity, non-controlled probably unless they ever re resurrect the successor corporation, uh, the successor business rules they tried. Um, and we might be, in fact be able to count that as, as a qualified replacement plan of our sole proprietor. So there's some attractiveness there. Now, all increases in benefits or allocations, including the income that's allocated uh, to a transferred amount, are treated as employer contributions for their annual benefit um, uh, for annual addition purposes, annual benefit or annual addition purposes. So all of the money that's allocated, when it's allocated, is an annual addition. And in determining whether the 415 limits prevent transfer assets from being allocated, the transferred amounts are treated as the first annual addition. So if you have a money, per, if you have a, a, a otherwise an allocation that's required uh, to an individual, um, you allocate first from your suspense account. If that brings that person to the 415 limit, that's it, and that's where the money came from. There is an ordering procedure, um, and those are the first dollars. The interesting thing about that rule is it is not in the law. And I reference it specifically here. It's in the House report uh, on page 81 of the House report. Um, and my guess is you'll need that reference someday um, because somebody will say, you can't do that or that's not right. Um, and I think that, that, re that referring back to the House report is going to be necessary. Why it's not in the law, I don't know, but it's not. If the service ever issues regulations, one would hope that in this case they would also take into account the sense of Congress and, and agree with what Congress actually wrote in the report saying that there is this ordering procedure. So that's how we expect um, it would work. Okay, does that answer the questions we had on allocations? There's a question in the back. Is it a long question? I don't think it'll be real long. Okay. It's got to be 15 seconds or less. If the QRP terminates before the suspense account is or can't be used up, does that then be subject to the 50 percent tax? Let me just repeat the statement for those people who are listening in the car and wondering what we're doing. Um, the, 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 well, let me try it. The, the first part is we now have a situation where we have a QRP that's terminated before the full amount is allocated. Does the original reversion come subject to the 50 percent? Apparently not. Um, the only thing that that becomes subject to is the current reversion becomes subject. Well, you just set up a suspense account. Two years later, terminate that plan, and the only thing subject to 50 percent is the balance of the suspense account. Is the amount that has not been? Yeah, yeah. Because you've increased you've increased the benefits by that 25 percent. Yeah, I don't see any problem. That, well, no guarantee that this makes sense. If that's the case, why would you never pay the 50% excise tax? Yeah. See, you can never get the money. Stop replacing plans from the next day. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah, that's good. We still have a permanency requirement on the plan. Um, and if they would, if, if, if you would violate the permanency requirement, then we would have a problem that they perhaps would go back and hit the original reversion. Um, so the question is, do we have a qualified plan? And my guess is that's how the service would attack it. I have no guarantee what they would do. But that's what, that appears to be what the law provides. The question here. No, I did not say that. The, the question is, is the income on the annual, uh, on income in the suspense account that's allocated uh, part of the annual addition? The answer is yes, it is. It is. The amount that's allocated to the account, the one-seventh, one-sixth, one-fifth, which automatically includes earning, is an annual addition. It is an annual addition. The question that I had up front here was, can you use an existing plan? Absolutely. It does not have to be a new plan. And question on the side. Mike? No? Yeah. The question about doc the question is being asked is what kind of documents do you need in establishing your, your payout provision? I don't think we know the answer to whether you can change it. Um, yes, you're going to have to establish a new document. We're going to get to a sample uh, or some of the issues on the documents in a moment. Um, if you establish it at five years, for example, and decide to change it to seven years, is that permissible? I'm guessing, but I don't see any reason why an amendment to an existing plan um, of that kind, it doesn't have a 411D6 issue. Um, it would not be acceptable as long as you're still within the scope of this law. If it allowed you seven, excuse me? Can you shorten it? Yeah, I think the same thing is true. You could have gone in with one year um, and allocated the whole amount. If you go in with one year and it takes longer because you have 415 caps, you'll go more than one year anyway. Um, I don't see a, any specific prohibition on it, but certainly that's the kind of issue that the, the service uh, you know, may decide something else, and there's nothing in this law that, that gives us guarantee that it's, o that it's okay. Um, I would probably caution a client that he should go into it with the idea that this is what the period is going to be and accept it. And when he calls two or three years later and says, I'd like to change it, um, then we're going to deal with it at that point. Maybe we'll have more guidance, but probably not. Um, maybe yes for a private letter ruling, but probably not. Um, probably you fly by the seat of plan pants and do it and hope that it's okay. Um, because there's nothing specifically that I see. Another question in front. Uh, do you see any problem with a qualified replacement plan that only covers owners and maybe only spouses because everyone else was laid off? Yeah, the question is, do I see a problem with a corp that covers only owners or owners and spouses because everybody was laid out? As, as the law is written, it says it's 95% of the employee of the, of the people who were previously covered who are not terminated. And I think if all of the employees are terminated and you only have the owner, that's okay. You still have a 415E issue, you, you know, combined plan limits. Um, but there seems to be no prohibition. And as I said, that's a, a nice thing that they did to say we didn't have to cover uh, more than an owner employee if he's the only guy left. That seems to be perfectly acceptable. Okay. What about effective dates for all this? Um, the above rules generally apply to reversions occurring after September 30th, 90. Um, they do not apply to any reversion after September 30th, 90 that we're in the following uh, categories. First of all, a plan s subject to Title IV of ERISA, subject to PBGC. If a notice of intent was to, ter to terminate was provided to participants, or if there were no participants provided to the PBGC, and we've all had those cases, um, if that notice was provided before 10 190 um, then it's not subject to the 50% to the reversion issue. It's under old law. If we have a plan that's subject to Title I but not Title IV of ERISA, then a notice of intent to reduce future accruals under 204H, the 204H notice, uh, was provided to participants in connection with the termination before 10190. And of course, every single plan that falls into that category met that requirement, and, and certainly you can find that, that 204H notice. That's, I think, the same 204H notice that we had for the elections in 83. Um, anyway, plans, that was actually 242B, 242B. Um, but it's, it's the same concept. It's in the same drawer. It's in the same drawer, that's right. It's probably in the same file. Um, clients should have one of each. Um, plans that are not subject to, to, to either uh, Title I or Title IV of ERISA, um, if the request for determination was um, submitted with respect, uh, request with respect was filed before 10190. Sole proprietor plans, no rank and file employees, 
uh, what we're talking about there. Um, in a one participant plan, it's not subject to Title 104 of ERISA if a resolution terminating the plan was adopted before 10 190. So those are the transition rules. We're past that time for most people at this point um, uh, to find these things or to deal with it, but you do need to know when the rules were because we still have plans that haven't distributed assets yet. And the worst thing to do is to have a procedure where when you distribute, you fill out the, the, the tax form and you pay 50 percent. Uh, if that company is not, in fact, subject, that plan was not subject to the reversion tax. Um, there are some other issues um, in the termination area that we do have to deal with. Um, and, and these are the sticky issues. These, these are the things that make it all not all that clean. How do you calculate that 25% cushion amount? Um, it's of the amount, the maximum reversion. The maximum reversion is not known until the day you distribute assets. We already had the example of how that can happen. It can happen a hundred different ways. Um, how do you know you're right? What if you have an asset, what if you have an insurance contract that has a surrender value? I mean, all of the issues we deal with um, in valuing assets become absolutely critical when you have to be right to the penny. To the penny. You distribute an insurance contract and it's got an 8% surrender and you use that value as the current value of that contract, of that asset, in order to get to how much extra assets do you have. What if you're off a few cents? Where is the threshold? There isn't any in the law. It's 25%. Tom Terry told us that at the bar. It's either 25% or 25%. There is no option. Um, what do you do if you're wrong? How will you know if you're wrong? Uh, those are all very good questions, and I don't have any answers, so don't ask me. Um, how do you increase benefits? But but Rich has an answer. Let's hear it. No, no, Rich, Rich has a question. Oh. I, find, I, find <laughs> I told words, you, don't ask me. Well, um, no, the, the words, the, the maximum reversion, um, because to some degree, the timing of the reversion is subject to some discretion by somebody, the employer, the trustee, whoever. And I wonder if, let's say, you have a situation where your, li your uh, liabilities are a million dollars and you have a million two hundred thousand dollars, so you have a, a two hundred thousand dollar reversion, let's say, on the date of termination, and let's say a month later you have, uh, let's say you had some money in executive or something, and now you have a million one hundred thousand, was the maximum reversion two hundred thousand, or is it only one hundred thousand? Right. Absolutely great question. Is it, is it the highest possible reversion during the period of time? Is that what maximum reversion means? I hope not. But I don't know. I don't think so. I think it's the day you make the distribution that the maximum reversion is cal calculated. I sure hope well, that's the what case. Would be, what would then be something other? I mean, it seems like the, the reversion is a given number. It's not something that's subject to a minimum and a maximum. Ab you're right. Um, is, unless you interpret it as being time sensitive. I agree with you. It is a given number, and that's the problem. The, the issue is, what's the assets worth on that day? Do you have to physically sell everything and get a check? from the trustee and then you say it's exactly this to the penny and then you know what if you're distributing annuity contracts with values what if you're distributing life insurance contracts with values um, what if you have God forbid real estate in your plan um, or, or, or some other hard assets we do have some we still have hard assets we have cold coin the antique uh, coins that are not individually held for individual accounts um, they have to be evaluated every year and we do evaluate them every year what if the IRS disagrees by a dollar with our valuation? I mean, will they take us to court on a dollar? Probably not. But could we lose on a dollar? If you go by the absolute reading of the law, yes, I think you can. Um, it's a horrendous penalty, and it's just not clear. There's nothing that says good faith valuation here is okay. It says 25%. So it's, it's a concern. I just want to point out that don't tell your client, well, it's easy. We'll just calculate 25%. It's 25% of what number? And that number is not... It's a floating target, and it may not even be a quantified target on any given day. Question here in front. Would the maximum amount of reversion be applying how much the timing to how much the employer elects? If they elect not to put 25% in and not to take the uh, 20% the, the, the issue is if they, well, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. I think what you're saying is, is the maximum reversion the amount that they would end up with if they hadn't elected to increase benefits or set up a corp. I think that's true. But the issue is still what is the dollar amount on the day that you're calculating it. Yeah, your high number is not what you get in the check. It's what you get in the check plus what was transferred to the QRP plus 
what you increase benefits by. That's your starting number. And I don't think Rich and I meant to say otherwise. Um, that is the number, but that's calculated, I think, on the day of distribution. Um, who knows? It's not absolutely clear. It certainly is not clear. Question? Um, I just want to read from the Act. It says that uh, a qualified participant includes one who has a non-forfeitable right to an accrued benefit under the terminated, et cetera, et cetera, and whose service, which was credible under the terminated plan, terminated during the period beginning three years before the termination date and ending with the date on which the final distribution of assets, that would preclude people who were laid off. So therefore, the statement you made previously about it probably could cover just an owner, um, you'd have to look back to whether or not these people, in fact, had accrued and were in the plan for you know three years. It's, I don't think that was a correct answer that you gave before. This, this is the this definition. That's the definition of qualified participant. That's correct. Yeah. Um, so you, you have to be careful. That 95 percent bothers me. It really, yeah, I hear what you're saying. Let me think. really bothers me. No, I, I think the problem is, and, and I, I, want, I need to go back and look at the notes, I think the 95 percent is of active participants, not of qualified uh, participants. It's employed. Yeah. You, you, you're totally in with the, 95, with, the, with the qualified participant definition. You're absolutely right. That's in the notes. But I believe the 95 percent is of active participants. I'm pretty sure on that. But I, but I can't go into the specifics now. But after the session, we'll take a look and make sure. And if I'm wrong, I'll announce it tomorrow from the podium. Um, get back to the idea of, of the calculation of the uh, reverted amount. Um, you were talking almost as if things were simultaneous events, and I think that's not a excellent point. Uh, a, a, the case that specifically you have to um, disperse all plan liabilities before you can even talk about a reversion. So therefore, you know, presumably, uh, you've already. Uh, liquidated the trust, or you've got everything in a liquid form, really, and um, paid out all benefits at the time that the last benefit is paid out, then you know what the maximum reversion is, and then I think you can do the calculations relatively simply. Well, the concern that I have, though, is if you've distributed, if you've moved money to a qualified replacement plan, direct transfer, um, the valuation of that dollar, there's, a, there's an annuity contract, accumulation contract in there, what's it worth? Um, I, I'm saying that there's some issues that what if you transferred real estate? Um, I agree with you that it should be easy. It seems on the face. And in some cases, if it's all in a money market fund, I don't, I'm not going to have a problem. But I do think there are some issues. Another more esoteric issue is if you increased benefits 60 days ago, at, do you take the present value of that number 60 days later? That's a different number. I mean, even though there are some, some questions there that aren't all that clear is, is the issue. Question here. Uh, we, we're going to have to we're going to have to get it on the tape if you guys want to continue, and that's fine. Go ahead. Okay, it, it's not a calculation. Well, I mean, eventually, you do do a calculation, but what what I'm saying is that you're you're paying people out, and so that whatever funds are left after the last payout is made, that's the reversion amount. Now, I grant you that you have some problems about. Um, you know, the valuation of things that are not necessarily marketable. Um, well, I think that's the real issue, because I think currently when we do a reversion, we do our best estimate of what that reversion is and file the tax return. And the worst thing that happens if we're wrong is they say it's the wrong amount and you pay the difference in the tax. It's too high or too low. In this case, I don't think we can afford to be off by a penny technically. I mean, we, obviously that, that's insane, but if we're off by a penny technically in how much we transferred, we have a problem. Because we calculated the reversion amount too small. I mean, I understand that uh, the, the trustee has timing on all of the events, such that um, if you make an application for uh, a 5310 transfer, that just says that the transfer will occur sometime after 30 days has right. elapsed, such that at, during that period, you know, all of the valuations of hopefully good faith compliance with this can happen. Um, but at that point, you're talking about solely the amount 
of what is the reversion, not the calculation of the present value of benefits, so that the PBGC issue, um, while it is a real issue as to whether or not where the rates are at any one particular time, you've already decided on what the appropriate interest rate to use for the distributions because people have already been paid. Okay. I, I see what, what you're saying is that, that once they've been paid out, you know that amount. And, and I agree with you that, that is, that's already determined, whatever the amount was that was paid. Yeah, I've got Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I'll, I'll just let me go. I, I don't have a problem. Okay. Um, second item, how do you increase benefits on a non-discriminatory manner? What does pro rata mean if you have to do both at the same time? Um, what about integrated plans? Um, that's what I said. What about integrated plans? Um, those are significant issues. Um, I think you have to increase it on a non-discriminatory uh, manner. I think that means you have to take into account that the plan was already integrated if it was. Uh, I think that means that you probably can't do a true pro rata increase because that would violate A4. And it clearly says that you can't violate the non-discrimination rules of the 415. But Rich doesn't agree with me, does he? I don't know. We'll see. What do you no, say, Rich? What I wanted to ask you is that it seems to me that that increase is inexorably going to end up being characterized as a past service benefit. Since everybody's not going to get the same percent of pay for the current year, you're not going to satisfy a current accrual safe harbor, which means that it's a past service benefit. And if you've got people with more than five years, it seems like you have a really interesting situation there. Is that the way you uh, look at that? Absolutely. I mean, I think that this, this particular piece makes it extremely difficult to know exactly what is right. Um, you do it. You submit it to IRS. The problem is that they don't give you a ruling on how you calculated um, the reversion amount. They will give you a ruling as to whether or not your plan is, is uh, non-discriminatory upon termination. And I think that's all you can depend on is submit it and see what you get. Um, but in doing those numbers and preparing it, what's your best, best uh, good faith way of proposing it? I think you have to do it um, on, the, on the older style of non pro rata where you take into account what the benefits were in some kind of modified formula is the only way to justify that. Um, an, an age-old question, and, and I told my good friend here sitting on my left that the last two times I did this speech, his name came up, and this is why, Bob. Um, question is to file or not file. That is the question. Whether it is noble to suffer the slings and arrows of the Internal Revenue Service, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in the past, the two of us have, have had a diametrically opposed um, opinions. I always file, and Bob doesn't always file. Let's, say, let's put it that. And the question that I've got is, um, should you be filing these terminations? Um, we've always taken the position that we will. Um, and I, the question now that I get to ask Bob is, have you changed your mind? Only as it respects replacement plans, okay. QRPs. Otherwise, I still hold Y file. And, and what about the audit issue that that's liable to get you audited now because the service is looking for non-5310 filers on termination? Is that a concern? That question has now been on the 5500. We still have not had an audit. Okay. <laughs> there, there are some other. Uh, I'm going to hold off your questions. Okay. There are some other some plans to. Same same issue. We filed for two plan terminations. I'm going to hold off your question, okay. please. Um, there's, there's something I need to cover, and we only have a few minutes. Um, there are some other options uh, that you could do, and I just wanted to mention it. Obviously, target plans, if, if age-weighted turns out to be what we expect, then target plans should go away. So I don't know why they're spending a lot of time on target regs and how to recalculate things, because uh, an age-weighted plan is nothing more than a target plan that starts over every year, um, and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me to have target plans if age-weighted work. You can have a target you can have an age-weighted money purchase plan and get to your $30,000, 25% limit. Um, age-weighted allocation, sure, absolutely. How about payroll deduction IRAs? This is not a qualified replacement plan, but I did want to mention it. Um, we've got a lot of clients who have gone with payroll deduction IRAs to mimic 401k plans. Um, they are totally discriminatory. You pick and choose who you want to provide it to. You can provide matches. Um, you can match individual people on any basis you want. The only rule you have to worry about is don't exceed $2,000 or if they're married, $4,000 in two IRAs. Um, yes, you have the issue of whether it's deductible or not uh, under the current rules, though there's some hope that that may change, uh, but it'll be very expensive. It's an interesting approach. It's something that a lot of clients have done. Um, the problem is I haven't figured out how I get paid yet because uh, I don't sell products, uh, and that's a problem. 
Um, we get a one-time consulting fee and they're gone. They don't need us, there's no 5500s. Uh, the income passes through as W-2, it shows on the W-2, but they have their offsetting deduction on their 1040. Uh, we have a, a small hospital, regional hospital, that went, they eliminated their 401k plan and did this, and they were doing it all internally, and they're saving $30,000 a year in administrative expenses. Um, and they offered it to all their employees on a, on a certain basis. If you've been with us so long, we'll match it up to a certain level. Um, it is not an employer-sponsored IRA. Okay, it does not come under the filing rules because it's, it is the employee picks and chooses what they want to do. It's an option that they're providing and it flows through as compensation. Um, the only discrimination rules you have to worry about are normal discrimination rules of age, sex, uh, creed, and all those sort of things. So that's a, a, another approach. Um, I did want to leave a couple of minutes, but I do want you to look at what else is in the outline. Look at the termination amendment that follows the outline. Um, this is a sample termination amendment that has multiple paragraphs in it that don't fit together um, with all the paragraphs. In other words, they're optional paragraphs, and you'll notice that there is a, uh, a number of circles. Those circles identify generally optional paragraphs. But if you go to um, item four at the bottom of the, of the first page of the amendment, that's where we're talking about how to deal with the, um, uh, with the issue. The employer may, A, um, it, well, if the value of plan assets as of the termination date is greater than the PVAB, as of such date, the employer may elect as follows. They can recover the assets as already provided for in the plan. They may amend the plan subsequent to this amendment to increase benefits in a non-discriminatory manner such that there are no access, excess assets as of the plan termination date. That's how we deal with modifications in the, in the, uh, pers in the uh, interest rates that all of a sudden can change how much our benefits are and now we have an excess when we thought we had already allocated it. Uh, or you can allow the plan to be, um, amend the plan to allow for a transfer of 25% of such access to, to a qualified re replacement plan um, with remaining unallocated excess assets to revert to the employer and then the definition of, um, of the reduction. Um, that's basically how we've dealt with that language. Um, if you read that last paragraph on the bottom going on to the top of the next page, the plan can be provided, amended to provide for the pro rata benefit increases um, under this section. Uh, at least 20% of the excess assets, no more than 8% may be used to increase accrued benefits um, for the non-active. So that's how we dealt with that in the amendment uh, issue. Behind that is the thread that I suggest you take a look at, and behind that is the actual uh, law and the regulations and the uh, Internal Revenue Code. That's all I had to say. We've got three, we do have two minutes left if you want questions. Anybody? Those of you who are leaving, please, the evaluation cards. I definitely say go to the IRS for approval. We laid it all out exactly how our non-discriminatory formula is, how we're going to do it, and we told the IRS the whole thing is void unless you approve it. We got approval within three months. I, I agree with you. I always file up for approvals. Thank you. This is the end of this recording. Please advance the cassette as far as possible for the next play.